This little device is a motor, and it has no moving parts other than a cavity filled with liquid metal. And it could, potentially, revolutionize how satellites control their orientation in space. Or maybe not. I don't know. I'm just a guy making videos on YouTube. But it is a really cool idea, and there are some attractive features to a liquid metal motor like this one. So, today we're going to talk about Magneto Hydrodynamic Liquid Metal Reaction Wheels. This project was actually inspired by a comment on my liquid metal field emission project. Someone was curious if you could use a Magneto Hydrodynamic pump to spin up a liquid metal, and then use that as a reaction wheel. And I completely nerd sniped me, and I fell down a pretty deep research rabbit hole, culminating in the video today. So first, what's a reaction wheel? Well, it's basically just a flywheel that you spin up or down. When placed on a satellite, it allows you to change like the orientation of the spacecraft. This is done through the conservation of angular momentum. As the flywheel spins up in one direction, the spacecraft rotates in the opposite direction. If you have three of these in three different axes, X, Y, and Z, you can control the fine position and orientation of a satellite and point it at a target of interest, like a feature on the ground that you're tracking or distant galaxies. Reaction wheels are super common on satellites, and although there are a few different variants and technologies, they basically all boil down to the same thing, a motor with a flywheel attached to it. Okay, so what's up with this weird liquid metal thing that I built? When a strong magnetic field is applied to the liquid metal in one direction, and an electric current is applied perpendicular to that direction, the metal begins to flow. It follows the right hand rule that you might have learned about. Magnetic force is in this direction, and the electric field is in this direction, which means the metal experiences a force in the third direction, perpendicular to both. This kind of pump works with any liquid that's conductive, so you can technically use it on things like molten salts or even seawater. And there's a lot of interesting applications, not in space, using this kind of technology. And if we pump the fluid in a circle, we essentially make a rotating flywheel out of the liquid. It's a reaction wheel. Okay, so let's take a look at my prototype first so we get an understanding about um, you know, how it's constructed and how it works. And then we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of this technology and why it's interesting for satellites. My first device was very simple. There's basically like a plastic body or housing made out of Delrin, which has a channel in the middle to hold the liquid metal. A ring magnet is placed on the outside of the body, and smaller segment magnets are placed on the inside. It's magnetized so that the north and south poles are on the inner and outer faces of the magnet, rather than the top and bottom, like you would normally see on magnets. Then we place an electrode on the bottom, fill the channel with liquid metal, and then place another electrode on top. With the magnetic field horizontal and the electric field vertical, the direction of force that the liquid metal feels is perpendicular to both resulting in the liquid metal being pumped continuously in a loop. You can't see anything with the full electrode, but if we use a thin wire loop, you can kind of see the liquid metal rushing around and when the power is turned on. Unfortunately, the surface tension and oxide skin means the motion is under the surface and it's not super clear on video. To make it a little easier to see, we can take a wire and just poke it into the liquid metal. The electric field is contained to a relatively small region now. So the pumping action is most vigorous next to the electrode, and it grows weaker as it travels around the loop. It's not nearly as efficient, but it's a lot easier to see on video. So, does this work as a reaction wheel? Well, normally these things are tested on an air bearing, but as a quick and dirty approach, we can just hang it from a long piece of string. <laughs> Pretty cool. I mean, it's not the most amazing demo. The power supply wires hanging down prevents it from spinning very freely, but the fact that it twitches at all means that the liquid metal is generating a torque. And when the power is reversed, it twitches in the opposite direction. So it's a reversible reaction wheel. But, you know, without the mechanical bits like ball bearings and spinning rotors. And that's precisely why they're being studied. One of the main failure points of satellites are the reaction wheels. Specifically, the ball bearings that allow the rotor to spin. Bearings need to be lubricated, but lubricants don't really like the deep vacuum of space very much. So you either need lubricants that are space rated, which aren't as good, 
or you need to enclose the entire reaction wheel in a pressurized chamber, which adds weight and complexity. In addition to that, any imperfection in the ball bearing will generate tiny micro vibrations, which can affect the science payload. And finally, there are like stiction forces when the reaction wheel is at rest and begins to rotate, or when it changes direction. The stiction can damage bearings over time and also introduces vibrations. And all of these issues are gone in a liquid metal reaction wheel. There are simply no moving parts other than the liquid metal. No bearings to wear out, no vibrations, just liquid flowing in a loop. It's also really flexible because you can change the geometry of the pump to suit your spacecraft. You can make it out of simple plastic tubing or a custom printed design that fits the specific geometry of your satellite bus. I wanted to make a larger model to test, so I designed and printed a second device. This one is a rounded square shape with a rectangular channel to hold the liquid metal. This big device means it needs a lot of liquid metal, way more than I had purchased for the field emission project. It's expensive to buy this pre-made, but it is actually quite easy to make gallon stand. I made myself a big batch by combining gallium, indium, and tin together in a hot water bath. A few minutes later, and I had a few hundred grams of gallon stand ready to go. The metal is carefully loaded into the cavity and all the air bubbles are removed. Next, we position the magnets. At this size, it's impractical to cover the entire surface with permanent magnets like the first design. So instead, we use two large magnets positioned near the two electrodes. Now, I should say that these magnets are definitely not ideal. I just had them sitting in my shop from some other project and they're crazy strong, so I figured they would work fine but a real design would probably choose something a little more compact and suited to the shape here. You can also see like this steel horseshoe thing surrounding the magnets. This is just plain carbon steel that I had laser cut. They act as a back iron and help redirect some of the magnetic flux that would otherwise be lost. It's not perfect, in fact it's probably very bad and it's not the best kind of metal to use this, but it is better than nothing and was really easy to make. To test this one, I hung it from an even longer string and used some very thin wires with a lot of slack to provide power. When energized, there's a pretty dramatic rotation. The power wires again prevent it from fully rotating, but the motion is a lot more obvious than the first device. The increased diameter and volume of the liquid metal means it can generate a much larger torque than the first one. The circuit board that's sitting on top there, that's a buck converter and it's used to step down the voltage. And that's actually one of the big disadvantages of this kind of device, the power situation. Liquid metal is highly conductive, it's metal after all, so it's almost like a dead short across those electrodes. The power supply has to provide a very high current at a very low voltage. The buck converter is pumping out like 20 to 30 amps at about one volt which is relatively inconvenient to deal with on a spacecraft. They're not really designed for those sort of power arrangements. To really test these things out, you're supposed to put them on an air bearing table and use a battery supply. So there are no external wires influencing the motion. I printed up two different kinds of air bearings, a hemispherical one and a simple cylindrical bearing. They are super satisfying to play with, but unfortunately the hemispherical one was pretty hard to balance. I did hang some copper weights below the table, which helped lower the center of gravity, but it was still a little too tricky to really use. With the center of gravity being on top of the table, it makes the whole thing just too tippy. So in retrospect, it should really be redesigned so that either the payload is sitting inside of the hemisphere, or you have long rods that can hold counterweights that reach below the table to lower the center of gravity and keep it in a more stable pose. The cylindrical bearing worked a little better. Not perfect, but it was serviceable. Unfortunately, I could never really get the battery solution to work correctly. I think my batteries have built in short circuit protection, and this was tripping when they were connected to the buck converter. So it was never really like juicing the liquid metal and providing any reasonable amount of torque. Whatever the problem was, I never got it working, and frankly, I gave up because I just didn't care enough. I did try a test with the power wires and managed to get a full rotation before the wires twisted up. And not exactly what I wanted, but it was neat to see it working on an air bearing, even if it's kind of a janky setup. So I should mention a few of the other disadvantages of these devices. A big one is the liquid metal itself. It's non-toxic, so that's cool, but it's highly corrosive to most metals. So you really don't want this leaking on orbit, otherwise it's gonna eat your satellite from the inside out. 
It's also a complicated design space to optimize for. There are frictional fluid losses, which change depending on the geometry of the channel. There's dual heating losses, pressure versus flow, magnetic strength, like the list just goes on and on and on. And a lot of these variables are tied to each other. Changing the electrodes and the magnets affects the pressure and the flow, which might mean you need to redesign the channel geometry, which then introduces more fluid losses, and you get the idea. So it's a complicated thing to design. The permanent magnets also introduce a torque as they interact with the Earth's magnetic field, which has to be counteracted or compensated for. And then there are like complex fluid dynamic issues like pulsing and turbulence in zero gravity. But with all of that said, this is not an entirely theoretical technology. The group at TU Berlin has flown one of these reaction wheels, what they call a fluid dynamic actuator, on a satellite called Technosat back in 2017. And by all accounts, it worked pretty well. Another obvious question to ask is just how efficient these things are in terms of power consumption. Well, the answer is that mine is not. <laughs> it's horribly inefficient. Uh, I did some very rough calculations based on the footage, and it works out to about 6.2 millinewton meters of torque and 1.2 millinewton meter seconds of angular momentum, which are like decent numbers for a thing this size. And again, they're very rough calculations based on analyzing some very unscientific footage. But it was sucking down 22 watts during that time, which is terrible power efficiency. Luckily, the Berlin group has published some numbers, and theirs are much closer to traditional reaction wheels, and in some cases surpassing them. So mine is just horribly inefficient, which is really no great surprise. But the technology itself is potentially competitive with traditional spinning flywheels. As with all new technology, there are a lot of hurdles to overcome. But there's a lot of potential upside here if the technology can be refined. And I don't know, I think it's kind of neat to see these things move without any moving parts. You might have noticed that I've really been enjoying these space-related projects recently, and well, let's just say there's some cool stuff brewing in the background. If you'd like a sneak peek, go check out my Patreon. I've started posting update videos roughly every two to three weeks, discussing plans for future projects or showing unreleased footage. I'm starting down the road of some very long-term projects and expect a lot of details to be hashed out on the Patreon in the coming months. Otherwise, I think that's all I got for you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.